Well, hey everybody, I hope you're having a great start to your week. I'm Mitchell and welcome back to Let's Unpack That. So about a month ago, there was this little teeny indie, super underground movie called Barbie. I don't know if you've heard of it. Surprisingly, this, this movie has had a huge impact on a lot of people. I mean, you wouldn't think so. A movie called Barbie that's all pink. You're like, oh, that's not gonna be deep at all. Like, no way. I mean, yes, it had Dua Lipa as a mermaid and Nicki Minaj over the credits, but in between, there was a little bit of um, emotional roller coasters, you could say, or an existential crisis for some. And so myself and the two people that I'm about to introduce you to, we thought it could be interesting to talk about what this movie has meant to people, our reactions to it, and a little bit of why the movie has resonated with so many. So first off, I have Joe Hornberger here, and you guys may recognize Joe. He was here what was it, like a month ago, a month or two ago? But June, yeah, Pride. For those who don't know who you are, do you want to give everyone a little bit of background on who is Joe? Oh, God, who is Joe? That's literally what this entire episode's about. Is <laughs> 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 this, this, this horrific new question. Um, I'm Joe. Um, I'm so happy Mitchell had asked to have me back. This is like my third time, I think, on the pod, and I love being here, so thank you, Mitchell. Um, I'm from New York, or I live in New York, rather. I'm from Chicago. Um, I'm an actor occasionally. And that's really it. And I'm a big fan of the Barbie movie. And I'm loving your pink sweater. It's everything. Thank you. I, I think I ordered this as soon as Bar I saw it. As I like walked out of the theater and I was like, I'd seen it like online. And I was like, I don't own anything like fun and pink and cute. And then I bought it. I think it was probably because it was, I left that movie really unwell. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna get into it. that. Yeah, we we're are. We're gonna get into that. We're gonna unpack that. For all the listeners, we all are wearing pink. Yes, we're trying mm -hmm. our best. When Joe and I were initially talking about this idea, he was like, OMG, my friend Jared would be perfect for this. So Jared Alexander, welcome. Let's unpack that for the first time. Um, I'm so excited to have you here and to get your insights. Do you want to as well give everyone a little bit of a background and introduction to who you are? Yeah. First off, I'm so excited to be here um, and I'm thankful for Joe for recommending me. And also I'm so excited to meet you and chat about this movie that has been on all of our minds. Um, but yeah, I'm Jared Alexander. I'm an actor as well, and also an entertainment writer. That's that's pretty much me. I'm also in New York um, right now, and I'm really excited to talk about Barbie. Well, I'm excited to talk about it with each of you, and thank you both again for being here on a Monday night. Appreciate the time. Before we get too deep into the movie, one of the other iconic parts of it has been the music. Um, I believe that both both Dance Tonight and Barbie World are still in the top 10 of the Hot 100, so clearly the music's having an impact. Two, is there any songs that you guys really liked from the movie? All of them, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I feel so basic being like, I listened, I think, to Dance Tonight on repeat for like 14 days straight. Like, it was like the only song I was listening to as I was yeah. like walking around. It's it's so simple, and it's such like a an easy song, like production-wise, and like, musically but it's fantastic mm -hmm. i was so excited when they finally like released it after like you heard like the snippet in like the initial teaser you were like mm -hmm. the instrumental and we all knew that was the dua lipa song mm -hmm. yes i also selfishly really love i'm just ken it's it's a beautiful original song <laughs> <laughs> i watch it like win the oscar for best like new original right. song honestly um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it better be nominated just so we can get that live performance, at very least. I think, I think it has to be. I mean, I just think, the, literally the whole soundtrack, I feel like, as like a product of like the late 90s, early 2000s, like those, you know, like Clueless, or like, I mean, Girls, or like any teen movie has like, such amazing soundtracks that like, you listen mm -hmm. to this music. Like, I feel like five, 10 years from now, like any of these songs on it will come on, and will instantly like, take us back to 2023, <laughs> watching this movie. <laughs> I also really appreciated with this album is that they didn't take pre-existing songs. Yeah. Which I think they easily could have done for this movie and just like Greta could have slapped like a bunch of her favorites or a bunch of like nostalgic songs from like the 90s and the 80s and the 70s into Barbie and like reignite those or, or make them all like covers, which honestly would have been like a very cool concept as well. But I genuinely so appreciated having an entire album of new songs from honestly like our mm -hmm. current like favorite artists and like newer artists too, which I, I thought was sweet. Yeah, it's like a cool fusion of like old and new. Like I literally, I just think Barbie World, I was out this weekend and like the second it came on, everyone just like got up and was dancing. Cause yes. it's really like, you know, it's like the sound of right now, but also like that amazing sample that we all grew up 
loving and it's just it's just a banger and dance the night too but then also some of them really hit emotionally like the Billie Eilish song the Heim song is really sad it was the most fun I have seen in a movie theater I think ever yeah Um, and like and we grew up with like the Harry Potter world like Mm -hmm. where like uh, the midnight premiere was like the thing I have not seen a movie theater so excited and so cohesively on the same team and on board for whatever project this was since I think I was like eight when Harry Potter like two came out. Um, it was just, it was also like a lovely environment. Um, and it, it was similar to like the Beyonce concert in terms of just like everyone was so excited to be there and so happy and so excited and so complimentary. Like people dressed up for the Barbie movie. Like people, people put on looks um, and everyone was taking photos with each other. And it, it was like an event um, that those first few weeks that it was, I guess it's only been like a month, but like that first like week or two, it was such, I don't know, it just felt like a, like a community event. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was beautiful to see because we don't see that a lot at, at the movie theaters anymore. Yeah, those community moments, just in, I think in culture in general, in the age of like social media and like people being in their homes for work from home or whatever, like I think having moments where people, despite their backgrounds, can like rally behind a certain yeah. cause or or activity is so rare. I mean, when I saw it in Chicago, we were all wearing our pink outfits, like walking down the street, everyone's like yelling, hey Barbie, like random yes. people. And that's just like, yeah. that's so fun. Like I, I just, I love that. No, it literally made me think of, I, I know all of us are too young, but like when you see clips of like Titanic, it was like, that was such a moment, right? And like people were going again and again and it just like kind of took over the culture and like between music and like everyone going to see it and everyone talking about it. Um, I feel like that, this is kind of like that. Like it, you kind of really can't escape it. And also there was just like the element of surprise. Like they really kept under wraps like what the movie was about and what you were getting into. So I feel like there was like an excitement of everyone in there being like, I don't know what this is going to be, but like, let's do it. Like, it's going to be fun. It's Barbie and it's fun, but it also has some doses of like really <laughs> some real things too. Yeah. I don't think any of us expected to leave like distraught. <laughs> Right. Or, or completely like <laughs> changed, um, but no. It, 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 we had this, and we had Little Mermaid earlier this year, and so like I'm very hopeful for like the future of like big movies, just based on that, and like what we're putting out there, and the projects that people are involving themselves with, and like these cultural and community impact full movies. I, I feel like cinema's back because we've and been people we've wanting been to be shitty things. People also wanting to be, like, in community. Like, there was a big conversation during COVID of, like, will the movies ever bounce back? Like, are people going to just, if you could just watch it at home? And I think the answer is obviously yes. And even even with Oppenheimer, too, like, I think the two of them together, it, like, created this conversation. But the fact that people were literally willing to spend nine hours of their weekend in the movies. Um, and both movies are, like, breaking all these records. Yeah. And it's it's different than watching something at home. And I feel like it's always going to be like that. So I think it's exciting that we're getting turnouts like this. I do too. And I'm sad that the, the strike, as, as, as we are very much in favor of the strike, obviously, but mm-hmm. like, I was sad that it, it cut off like the rest of the promotion of Barbie. Um, but at least we got like the fantastic like red carpets and most of the premieres I think happened. And so like, yeah. whoever was their marketing team, congratulations. Like you win, you win life. Um, I don't know. It just feel like it reignited, like you said, Jared Titanic, like it reignited like a mass event. Of, mm-hmm. like, of cinema and like we have not seen a marketing campaign like this in years and years and years and years and years um, and like people not I'm sure people were over it but also like people were excited anytime something else came out and like doesn't mean we bought it but like we were so excited just to see it exist and now that it's a billion dollar franchise yeah I mean you've kind of done the transition for me but why Barbie like what makes this movie special I mean as you were alluding to the movie's made $1.297 billion worldwide. It's the highest grossing movie to be co-directed or directed by a woman. And it's, I think, as of today, the highest grossing domestic release from Warner Brothers of all time. Um, well, congrats to them. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and I think it's cool to see a movie that is so story or or message driven to be so successful especially in this age of people being like go woke go broke type narrative and there's been other movies that have also been message heavy and haven't been as successful as this i mean jared you 
to a degree, kind of live in this entertainment space. You've gotten to interview so many cool people. What's kind of your thoughts on what's made this movie different from the other ones that weren't able to connect with audiences as well? Yeah, I think there's lots of things, and I'm sure we're even going to get into like what the ultimate message is. But I feel like at the same time, I, it's been successful almost in spite of that as well. Like People are seeing it regardless, and you don't know the message until you've already paid for it, right? And I think that it's because Barbie is just this entity that means so much to people, whether you play with them or not. It is just like you say the name and like you instantly get a feeling or a connection, and it's been around for a really long time. And it's a really tricky property. People have really positive feelings about Barbie or negative feelings about Barbie or in-between feelings about Barbie. And I think the movie, in a good way, because it kept a lot of its cards to its chest, um, you didn't really know what it was going to be about. And I think the movie is a really interesting conversation about Barbie and what it means and what it means to the women who, or the kids who grew up with Barbie and the kids who didn't, and how it negatively, negatively impacted people or positively. And it isn't afraid to engage with that, but it's also not giving you any answers either. It's not firmly stating Barbie has been amazing for people or Barbie has been terrible for women or anything. It kind of just is literally the conversation about it. And at the same time, it's like about this doll, but the doll is a reflection of us, you know? And that's why it was made. So in a way, it is a movie about us, even though it's about this doll. Yeah, this movie is about us and so many people can see themselves to a degree in these characters. I mean, <laughs> the three people on this call are definitely not the target audience for this movie, no. but we each had strong reactions to the film to a degree that here we are talking about it, right? Um, <laughs> and I think since everyone can see themselves in it, perhaps that's why it's it's resonated so, so strongly with so many. Um, I guess this kind of leads into the emotional roller coaster or existential crisis that that <laughs> some folks had while watching the movie. For me, when I first saw the movie, I tried to go in with like as much of an open mind and not letting like movie critics or whatever kind of like cloud my judgment. I feel like sometimes I'll read a review and then I see what, what they meant and then that kind of clouds my own personal judgment of a movie. And so going into it, I knew that, you know, this is going to be a message, but I don't really know how it's going to be delivered, whatever. Like, it's probably going to be super feminist. Like, I, I knew that going into it. And I, I loved it. Like, I was living for it. Like, it gave me my musical theater dreams in a, in a movie almost. Like, it had everything that I was loving. And I think what really hit me, or at least really got me thinking, is towards the end of the movie when... Um, when Barbie and Ken are in her house and Barbie's apologizing to Ken and Bar and Ken's kind of freaking out and Barbie, I believe, says, like, it doesn't have to be just, like, Barbie and Ken. Like, it's Barbie and it's Ken. And kind of in that moment, separating yourself from the other parts of your life, like, whether that's your job or your relationship or, um, like, your hobbies. Like, who are you just as a person beyond all of those things that society kind of forces on to you. And I <laughs> I think when I saw that I was like, well shit. <laughs> like am I am I like happy in my own life without all of these other things? Like am I do I enjoy my job? Do I enjoy doing this podcast? Do I enjoy like going on dates with people? Like all of that stuff just really kind of shook me to think like is this stuff actually like sparking purpose for me in my life? Like am I actually happy doing these things? Um, and I came home from the movie and <laughs> had a glass of wine and sat by the fire and just like literally sat there for like two hours and was like, just like having this spiral. <laughs> and it's that those aren't always like fun, but it's also like a, I think a huge opportunity to like kind of have like personal growth in those situations and like really put yourself first. And I think it just kind of led me to want to make sure that when I'm in a position at work or when I'm doing this podcast, is it like, am I doing stuff that I actually want to do or am I doing things differently or changing who I am or changing the types of things that I put out into the world to, you know, um, please someone else or please a societal like construct. That was kind of my crisis that I had for like about a few days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was your reaction, Jared, to the movie? I felt... <laughs> as I'm like stuttering with my answer now. <laughs> um, 
It was a very existential day. I did do the Barbenheimer thing, so like they are very different movies. I want to know, do you, which one did you see first? Do you recommend doing that? I recommend doing that 100%. Actually, Issa Rae said that on the carpet of one of the premieres. She was like, why would I do... Like, and she was like, I obviously am in Barbie. I say go see Barbie, but why would I like depress myself at the end of the day? All that to say though, it is a movie. Uh, it does have some like existential themes in it. And like, makes you wonder about your place in the world in a different way. But Barbie in particular, I have been uh, professionally kind of in flux in my life. Like I cert- I've, have a theater degree, I still perform. Um, but I also have like really stumbled into a journalism career as well. And also writing my own projects, so. And a lot of times that can feel a bit like a crisis of like, what is my identity? Am I, am I just after Jared or am I writer Jared? Am I both? Um, and it's been really tricky, especially as theater starts to ramp back up, but kind of not really like what, where I want to be, what I want to do, how I like spread myself out. I really just saw myself in a lot of instances in the movie that like, it's okay to have questions about those things. And it's okay, you know, how stereotypical Barbie, the lead Barbie in the movie, has been this for so long and still has questions and doubts about her place and if this is right. And I think there was a lot of of that that I saw in myself. And then also just kind of connecting to like the inner child, Jared, as well. I like never had any Barbies. I really wanted them. I I can't remember if I ever actually asked, but I feel like... um, it probably would have been like a no-go, just like, you know, like 90s or 2000s, you know, there were like, I would get like Hot Wheels or something, or like Power Rangers, I don't know. I wasn't playing with cars, but I was playing with <laughs> Power Rangers. But all that to say, I was like, ugh, like, even Barbie left such an impact on me, and it made me nostalgic. So I'd say those things. Okay, okay, yeah. love it. Okay, Joe. <laughs> Joe I remember. <laughs> I remember before you and I even had texted about doing this episode, I remember seeing your reaction to the movie. And I remember you had had like an Instagram story with like your thoughts via notes app. And I think what you said was just so wonderfully stated. And I think your takeaways were just so incredible. And I know we, we talked about them a little bit. I got on. Yeah, of course we talked about them a little bit on a prep call previous to this. Um, (laughs) But Talk us through your experience seeing the movie and how you processed it all afterwards. It was, I mean, I went with two of my closest friends, Tony and our friend Wyatt, and we went like opening night and it had been like a big thing. And um, like everyone else, I don't think we really knew what it was. We knew it was going to be a really fun, campy, like girly movie. Um, And we were pumped. Um, And we didn't realize it was going to be this very, just like kind of like formative experience and I've, I've been telling everyone I was telling a, one of our uh, co-workers at work because she was like she hasn't seen it yet and I was like what I think makes it a really beautiful movie and what makes it a good film is that it is made for a very specific audience and everyone who sees it outside of that audience still has something to take away from it and connects to it and they're all very different connections Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what makes a good movie is when anyone can can connect to an ounce of what we see and relate that to themselves and maybe better themselves from it or at least take like a look at themselves to, to maybe change something or or maybe that like glimpse of light that they may need in some aspect. Um, and so I think this movie really just hit me at a place where I currently am in a very like hardship. Um, Jared knows obviously, but like acting is very, very hard. Um, and I feel like I talk about acting every time I'm on this podcast, um, but I, I, but I, I promise uh, actor Barbie, um, there are other, <laughs> other things. And so I think there were so many just layers to what I've been going through in private and going through like with like discussions with friends and, and professionally of just kind of feeling lost and feeling like you are malfunctioning when things do not go the way you want them to or the way you're hoping I won't even say your way because I don't think we even have a way in what we do but we want to work and we some of us are very used to working consistently and when those kind of things start malfunctioning and things don't go the way you're hoping instead I think a lot of us and this is myself we start looking at us as the problem and we go to it as a problem and so when Barbie started being like oh I'm malfunctioning and talking about me like, things aren't working with me anymore. Like I'm noticing a lot of other aspects of the world that, that I'm not used to and 
that I can't relate to right up, right out of the gate and that I'm questioning and that just, they just don't link up and make sense. Um, I just sat there from, and that's in like the first 10 minutes. And I was just like, Oh no, I was like, this movie's <laughs> going to be, be a lot for me. Um, and it was, um, I literally stopped in the Uber on the way home. Um, and it was beautiful. It was a, it was a $20 therapy session. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't, there was just, a, there was a, I won't even get into the whole notes app, but it was, it was a beautiful experience and a beautiful reminder and lesson that malfunctions are not maybe that you're broken. It's, it's more so that like malfunctions can mean growth. Um, and that I think we were always in a place of growth. And that these closed doors or these malfunctions per se in quotations will lead to you getting fixed in quotations in a different way. Um, and I don't know, I, like I said, I, I was just in a place where everything clicked and, and her making a change and a choice at the end, I was like, that's, it, it just was like looking in a mirror being like, this is exactly what I needed in this moment. Um, and that, that a change needed to be made and to sit there and acknowledge and accept and allow yourself to not have to be President Barbie and to be political science Barbie and, and Nobel Peace Prize Barbie and to still make sure that you are just as worthy and valuable and I don't like the word special, but that you hold just as much space in settings as mm -hmm. those people um, mm. because we're, we're around people that are doing incredibly well. Um, and not that we're not doing well in, in, in what we're doing. We just have expectations kind of put on us in what we do, and especially with social media and especially performing. And, like, my goals are very, very high. And, and my standards for myself and the pressure I put on myself is very high. And sadly, a lot of those things are not in my control. And so sitting there and watching Broadway Barbie or watching television series Barbie or watching Influencer Barbie and all, and all of these things that we... Uh, and we as in Jared and I and, and actors here in New York as I can only really relate to witness around a lot um, and, it's, and it's witnessing our peers and our friends and our neighbors and our, and our Barbies and our girlies succeed and it's so exciting and then you're, you just kind of sit there at times and you're just like well, great like what am I offering and then you start looking at it as, as that malfunction um, and it just was a beautiful reminder that it's okay just to be stereotypical, stereotypical Barbie and to just be Barbie. And that doesn't make you any less than in the moment. And that doesn't make you any less special. Um, and that like you are welcome to change and you are welcome to be whoever you want. And that's kind of the magic of Barbie. Um, I don't know. It, it just, I, I've been talking about this movie for fucking hours. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just, it just was a very special film and it was a very special thing that I needed in that moment. And I just, I don't think I expected to literally leave changed and to have this completely new outlook on, on life and on where I am. Because I, I, I will say, I think we said in the, in, the, in the prep talk that like, while the three of us are not that demographic this movie was made for, I think our ages, I think this movie was, well, Mitchell's, maybe not Mitchell, Mitchell's a baby. But <laughs> <laughs> Jared and I, of, and I. Our, of our age, um, I, yeah, I had just turned 28 and I, I was going through this, this like, just like exhaustion of, of age and feeling old and feeling kind of expired and that your shelf life is, is you're kind of being pushed to the back of the shelf while the, while the new cuter fun Barbies are, are being put up. Um, but I think that was the demographic it was really made for is, is our age range of, of we're, we're young enough to remember the nostalgia and to start going through like this, this kind of like life mid early crisis, existential, existentialness -ness to look at. And I think post pandemic, a lot of us have, have gone through that. And so I don't think this movie would have hit as hard pre pandemic. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that answered the question. Um, but I loved it. It's it just it was a very special movie, and I think it's gonna be a special movie at least to me for a very very long time. Um, I've seen it twice now, and I can't wait to watch it when it streams again. Um, I don't know. It just and then obviously there's there's other fun parts that you're just like I have no relation to this, but I, I love it like fucking Will Ferrell and <laughs> and uh, and all those other things. But yeah, I think Greta knew exactly what she was doing. Um, and there's, there's just so many beautiful moments that are just a reflection of all of us. Um, and I don't think we've seen that in a, in a movie in a really long time. At least that I've seen. Love. Love. For you, Jared, did you have similar reflections on the film, especially living in New York 
and dealing with New York culture. Did you have any of those similar reactions when it comes to seeing yourself in that New York cycle? As, yeah. as, did you as, also as, have a breakdown? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, as my did eyes you also grow, like, cry in the sizes. Uber? No, I think, honestly, to what Joe was saying, like, it, it is an interesting takeaway that you could interpret the movie that, like, it's the... Inv- she's outgrown the environment. So, like, she is malfunctioning because, like, the environment isn't really suiting her. Um, and then also, parallel to that, um, America Ferreira's character, who's connected to her, is experiencing her own things and, and her own transition in life and her as, as a mother. Um, not that I'm like, my New York experience is like being a mother. Um, <laughs> my New York I'm experience is America Ferreira. <laughs> yes. But I do think that there is something to be said about environments shifting and that's not necessarily being exactly what you need them, what you came to them for or, or what you thought they would be. Um, I know we talked a little bit when we were all talking, like I have had an interesting experience because like during the pandemic, I moved home for a year and that's kind of what I related to because I'm from Connecticut. I'm always going to love home and it's really not that far from here, but it is different. And it was such, it really messed with my head being home at 25 at the time and everything being exactly the same, but everything being completely different and me feeling just like in the back of my mind, I was like, well, I can always go home or I can, this can always be like, I can always go back to that version of myself but it felt like, you know, old pants that just don't feel right. Or like, it, it just feel, it felt like I outgrew certain things or, or I was different. And I, I think that that's okay. And that means that, and maybe it's not New York forever for me. Maybe I'm sure I'm going to feel that way about here at some time and I'm going to need to go somewhere else. Or sometimes it isn't physical. Sometimes it is professional or it could be romance. It could be at any part of your life. Um, but yeah, I feel like, We've been dealt a a rough hand the past few years and a lot of change, and it's still really hard to grapple with. And it was nice to just sit and watch a movie that is like about grappling with change and you seeing that because I feel like we've all just kind of like adjusted and pretended like it's okay for us to (laughs) not that it's okay, but we all are just like have really normalized it. We're all just like, oh yeah, we like had a like total pandemic and like everyone just like their lives were totally upended and we're all good. Um, Yeah. It's almost like we're gaslit into like everything being totally fine. <laughs> but it's like ourselves. some right. Where it's like I'll still have moments sometimes where I'll like zoom out of my life for a second, and totally disassociate. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> I'm like, what just happened the past three years? You know. So I think that um, definitely to what you were saying, Joe. Too, I think that this movie, like all art um, that's been coming out, but especially this, uh, had it come out, let's say in 2019, it just would have been different. I know I would have been in a completely different yeah. place. A hundred percent. And I think it was a beautiful reminder that, like, change is okay. I think we're so scared, especially being here and especially in what we do. And I'm sure this actually probably relates to everyone. Like, even if you're home, like, I think you're, you're kind of forced growing up to never want to feel like you have to leave home or you want to leave home. And then you, you, you're made to feel bad if you do want to leave home and that you, you're moving far away. And then, God forbid, you, you perform and you, can't, you don't want to live here anymore. And it, 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 there's always, there's always, I think, in a force or a, or a third party that makes you feel bad for wanting change, um, where we're where we're kind of forced in, to feel like we have to be somewhere in order to to maintain normalcy or to exceed where we would like to be. Um, and it just was another lovely reminder that, like, yes, that's terrifying, and she's terrified in it. Um, but how exciting and how liberating and freeing when you do get to make that choice and then you do realize that this, it's worth just trying. And like Jared said, that you've outgrown your environment. Um, and that that's okay. I think, I think feeling that way at times can be very scary and it, and it can feel kind of like an, exp- like I think I said earlier, like an expiration date. Um, which in like that word term means like death or like in those, or like just like you get tossed out and you're thrown out. And I think this movie framed it so beautifully as like a rebirth or a renaissance per se. Um, and it was just, I, you, you haven't, I haven't never looked at something like that before. I think in the few times that I have thought about leaving New York or, or looking elsewhere to go and to live, like you feel like a failure and you feel kind of like a loser where you're like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm doing. 
I have to leave. I have to flee. Um, this isn't for me anymore. And to, and to uh, instead look at it being like, whoa, I may not be happy here. And I can do this anywhere, actually. And, and put my happiness first before I think where you're supposed to feel like you're supposed to be. Like, I think she very much felt like she had to be in Barbie land. And that was where, like, where else would she be, you know? Where else would she go? Um, and, to, and to take that, that leap of faith and that step because it makes you happy and, and it makes you in your own control of things. And I think, obviously, Barbie had never felt in her own control in, in that environment. And I, I don't know. It just, it was, a, one, it was another fucking layer of just beautifulness of being like, it's okay to want something else and it's okay to want change. Um, and to advocate for yourself in, in those ways. And that you will find people who, who root for you in those situations and who will encourage it as scary as it may be. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with the, the feeling of wanting change and in, in outgrowing your environment. I felt like that was actually a huge theme of the movie without like mm -hmm. it being said. Yeah, and I think that's something that I've when I was having my crisis by the fire with my glass of wine. Um, it sounds so much more beautiful than mine. I'm so jealous. It it's it's, it's giving the end of Call Me By Your Name when he's just yes. like crying into the fire. Beautiful and artsy. Meanwhile, in New York, you're like crying next to like a rat. <laughs> but I think there's like a level of, of comfortability with like where you're currently at in your life and like letting yourself take the risk and taking that leap is so, so scary. It's terrifying. Yeah. But I feel like actually everything that I've always been scared of doing has always paid off. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, I can name like three things that I've been terrified of doing in my life. And I did them. And the outcomes and what the aftermath that occurred were some of the highlights of, of anything I've ever done. And this movie highlighted just taking risks um, and going that extra mile um, just to try. Um, like they said, like you can always come back to Barbie land. You just have to go through that process of getting there again. Um, and she, she made that trip a few times. Um, but yeah, I feel like that, that risk and that fear is always there. But usually it, it always is there. And I think it always will be, no matter what you do, no matter how comfortable or uncomfortable you are in the situation, you always have that little voice being like, well, do you, want, do you really want to do this? Are you sure? Um, Cause like, like weird Barbie said, she was like, no, you have to want to go do it. Like mm -hmm. it's not an, it's, it's not like the option. Like you, we know you want to take the easy way out and just right. like forget about it. But like, you have to take the Birkenstock. Like you, yeah. you have to go through the mud to, to figure it out. She embraced that uncomfortability and it mm -hmm. ended up working out for her. So As it did. I also think that even to what we were just talking about and like the risk and, and being scared, like that always is there, but I, and especially with how we talked about how, like, the audience seems to be, you know, not even, like, teens, really, definitely people who are, like, at least have reached adulthood or a certain period. Like, I personally have always been someone throughout my youth, like, obviously, like, college auditions, going for theater, who was, like, really? Yeah, I would be scared, but I was, like, opportunities seemed limitless to me. Like, I was, like, I'm going to make it happen. Like, you know what I mean? And I, like, dreamed big. And, like, I feel like the past few years, you feel... <laughs> Like you said, like with like a sort of like a quote unquote expiration date, it feels like your opportunities get slimmer and slimmer and there's just like a narrower and narrower way of being and how you can live and when you had this plan set out and it doesn't go your way and I feel like it, it <laughs> it's, it's one thing when you're like a, a kid or you're like a teenager and it's like take the risk, like dream big and that is scary but also you have literally the whole world ahead of you. And also, we still do, frankly. Of like, course, I also yes. feel like, I, I don't know how you guys feel with, with your peers too, but I found, especially since the pandemic, like my whole friend group and my peers, like we all are aging ourselves up a lot as well. And I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll be listening to this podcast and I'll be like, Jared, you literally <laughs> were 28. You were right. a baby. You know what I mean? So literally. I think that I think that that's definitely a part of it too. It is a universal lesson and an evergreen lesson because I think that's actually harder and harder as you get older, which is not something I've ever yeah. really thought about. Like I would figure that like, oh, like when you're really young, you have to learn to take risks and they'll pay off and then like you'll know that forever. But yeah. as the world changes around you with age, you kind of need to tell yourself that more and more. I also feel like we're, Jared, in that first, first ever kind of phase of that. I feel like every major change, like age-wise we've gone through, they've been the exciting ones. It's like, oh, I'm a teenager. Oh, I'm a 20 year old. Oh, I'm a 21 year old now. Oh, I'm 22 now when I'm out of school. Ooh, I turned 25. Like, 
pop. Yeah. And now I think you kind of, which, like you said, we're going to listen to this or think about this years down the road and be like, you stupid, stupid bitches. Like, <laughs> right. shut up. Um, yeah. But I think this is the first time we're experiencing that kind of fear and that kind of wake up call. And trust me, the pandemic aged us all. Um, but we lost time. Um, and we lost kind of a formative time. And everything just seems like it's gone very quickly since mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And it's kind of been, a, and I mean, I'm celebrating six years here, I think this month. And like, to me, that's wild. In the grand scheme of things, is that very long? No. But I think we're, we're finally hitting those late 20s and that, that early entry phase of just like a giant life change um, to where it's just everything hits harder. And it's kind of that wake up call. Um, and even my mom, I've had plenty of conversations and it's been about acting and it's been about like things not necessarily going the way we, we thought it was going to go for now. And, um, and she's like, I don't ever want to have that phone call with you to, to where being like, you got to figure it out. Like when, when do you throw in the towel and when do you, you, you do something else? Because she's like, it, it is, t- it's coming. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's real pressure and it, and it is real life, you know? Um, especially with the insecurity of what we do and the, the flexibility that's necessary, but really, um, unrealistic and, uh, especially like looking even just at, at the paychecks of these shows, you're like, great, I, I can do it, but at what cost life choices are, are starting to be made for us. Maybe who did not have to make them at the beginning or they may be like, Oh, I'm going to move to New York and be an actor. Fierce, slow. Um, like, yep, that's going to be hard. Woohoo. Like I'm talented. Um, and now things look a lot different and, and we're, we're approaching things differently and we have to approach things differently because real life is hitting. And I think we, uh, trust me, and I think gay Twitter is also, and I'm, and I'm privy to it of being like, Oh, you're 30. Here's your gravestone. Like, right. um, <laughs> so like, yeah, like did you get the group on of, of the, of the grave site? Um, and so like, that's not, we're not helpful to anyone above that age. Um, I know we're approaching it. And so it's just, I, like I said, I, it's, it, everything just hit at a very good and bad time. Um, I wish I just enjoyed the movie versus <laughs> it being like a giant reflection. Um, but it also was, I, I think I've said it in a different way, but like, I don't know, you kind of leave feeling comforted in the way of being like, okay, we have, we have mountains coming up and we have treks in these journeys and these chases that are about to occur, we get out of it though. And we come out of it different and we come out of it maybe better. Um, but at least we come out of it and and we do figure out what we need to be doing. Um, couldn't tell you what that is obviously. Um, but it was comforting watching it, knowing be like, and that's what I love about the movie, which like spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, skip this part. Right. We've also been talking so <laughs> they much. Made about it, they yeah. made it this far. <laughs> but like, if you haven't seen it, like I don't want to tell you the end, but also like, I can't tell you how the movie ends because all we know is she goes to the gynecologist. What the fuck does that mean? Right. What's she yeah. doing in the real world? She's in a blazer. Like, an, uh, like it's the first time Margot really, like doesn't look stunning in the movie and like we do, I couldn't tell you what happens with Barbie afterwards like I don't know where it goes and I hope to god we don't get a sequel because I don't really want to know okay well a transition to a lighter note I have a little <laughs> <laughs> so like, enough with a that. fucking sob story <laughs> for you 28 year olds so I came up with a few questions per Joe's request um, Joe loves trivia he, he played trivia last time he was here I lost I lost trivia last time, so this is my hopeful attempt at winning. But Jared's the movie king, so I did listen to that episode for sure, and it was it was tough though. And you, you definitely gave out like good, good, good answers. It was just Me? it was tricky. Yeah, I listened to that episode. Yeah, I didn't give any answers. I didn't know a single question. I feel like you did one or two, and they were like vaguely Wrong. off. <laughs> right, but they were like Wrong. totally out of left field. You know, they were they were kind of in the ballpark. Yeah, so some of these have correct answers, while some of them are more so just, like, fun asking for, like, your thoughts based on the prompt, okay? Okay. So first question here. Greta Gerwig co-wrote Barbie with her husband. What's his name? <gasps> Noah Baumbach. Did you know that one, Joe? No, I was going to say David. <laughs> 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 that sounds correct. Yes. Good okay. They had a... They also, I was like reading 
um, they had like a son earlier this year too, which I think is really interesting considering what the movie talks about in terms of manhood. You know what I mean? She's so pissed. She was so pissed she had a boy. (laughs) Right. But also I think it does (laughs) grapple with certain things. Like I think it's interesting knowing that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We didn't even touch the Ken shit of this movie, Um, which is I think so funny that like the gays didn't relate to Ken at all. We were like, (laughs) we get it. Like Ken's Ken's Ken and Ken sucks. But like Barbie, Mm -hmm. which makes sense. Okay, so precursor to this one. This is a prompt question. Do you guys watch Real Housewives of New York? The New Do York. I watch Real Housewives of New York? Jared and I text about it every week. <laughs> <laughs> Did, Did you, you watch guys, last night? No, of I course. need to watch it still today. I haven't watched, I watched it, it today. Yet. It's good. I also want to know, since you guys do watch, who is your favorite housewife on, on Roni? I know Joe's answer. Joe, there you go. You go. <laughs> uh, Miss, Miss Whitfield. Bryn. Bryn okay. I think Bryn is actually maybe my favorite housewife of all time. Okay. I think she is slowly taking that crown on my end. Okay. I, I'm obsessed with her. Okay. She's great. How about, how about you, Jared? Um, I would say Bryn, too. But I, I really do feel like all it was such great casting across the board. Mm-hmm. Like I just they think have that great like, chemistry. Absolutely, and it was a heavy. It was a big ask. A lot of people were not happy about the decision, but I think they really took their time with it and made it work. But Bryn, I think, is she's got legs. She's got staying power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I like. Mm-hmm. I, I genuinely think even the ones that I don't agree mm-hmm. with. Like, yeah, I, I see all of their places. Yeah, in, this I, week's I episode. Great. Fucking lions. But my favorites definitely Bryn is in the top. I love Jenna. I love Aaron. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The rest of them, I feel like I haven't gotten to know them enough yet. Jessel's personally on my lower tier. I know that. I don't... <laughs> but yeah. I love them. They all work together really well. So that's the thing is that they all just mesh yeah. so well. Whoever was the casting director for this like, should get an Emmy <laughs> or something for <laughs> casting. They give them the Emmy. But that's the thing with Jessel. Like, would I be friends with Jessel? I don't think so. But mm-hmm. I also can't imagine this season without her. Yeah, because like, right. it works so we well. We need like a little out of someone, a little out of touch. No, I love them all. I love Uba. I'm excited to see more of Uba. Same. Um, Me I too. Like she's, mm-hmm. I I think she's she's, there's stunning. a lot. She's stunning. Jared was at the premiere. Jared's met I them. I was at the premiere. I have Jared met them. met them all. Well, all except like I did like not meet Jessel. Was it like a step and repeat, or was it like? It was really cool. Mingling? It was like at the Rainbow Room, so there was like a carpet, um, and then there was like an after party. It was very cool and very fun. They were all, they're all as advertised, which I think most Real Housewives are. Like, what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. Um, but I only, I got to talk with Bryn the most, and she was just a dream. I can't believe I have A dream, a dream, her. a dream. You will, for sure. For sure. She's I around. Love it. I love I, it. I I'll love find it. her. Okay, well, while we're talking about that real quick, before I ask, ask this question, um, if you do need anything else to use your Peacock subscription for, I highly recommend Love Island USA. I watched, like, 14 Wait. episodes this weekend. It's so I good. did see a clip. With the Sarah like a Highland clip that's clip? going viral? Yes. yes. And I was kind of like, that's, okay, wait, this looks kind of crazy. That's why I watched it. And I got so into it. There's like a bisexual storyline now. And like, it's really okay. just like, it's, if you need a, if you need something, Jared, I can see Joe's against it. But I yeah. am addicted. <laughs> Joe, are you not a dating show gay? No, I think it's embarrassing. I, I really do. <laughs> I, I'll die alone before I'm on a dating show. Dating show. <laughs> I, I think they're mortifying, to be on. Um, I, I do, I've watched them. I just, I, I'm not a bachelor boy. I did the love is blind one. I did season one. I watched that and I thought that, that was, was the best season. Like, best season. Okay. Season two was bad. Um, I just sit there and I'm like, how are you signing up for this shit? Mm-hmm. Because like you're mock- mocked. Um, I just don't like love Island. That's all. That's why I was shaking my head. I, I, I'm not a that's love fair. Island person. Hey, that's fair. I'm not one either, but I saw that clip of Sarah Highland being disrespected and it? I, She's, she's like the Sarah host. Highland? She's the oh. host. I was like, why is Sarah Highland on Love, Love Island 4? Uh, <laughs> Peacock is paying, I guess. Sorry, I'm hijacking. But, like, did we all watch R- Red, White, Red, Blue? Yes. I read the book, I too. Did you, have I you guys read the it. book? Yes, I read it in Milwaukee. Oh, really? I think I put it away. I don't know where it is, but it's that, somewhere here. T- so my, my hot take is the book is like 10 trillion times better than the movie. They took yes. out all the most meaningful parts of the story that made it an incredible queer story that showed like what made like their family growth, their personal growth, like all these mm-hmm. personal things and just made it a stereotypical rom-com, but they're gay. 
Um, Mitchell came here with guns. <laughs> that's guns my hot ready. take review. But it's really cute. Loved it. I didn't love it. You like, didn't even enjoy the movie? I liked it fine. But for all the reasons you said, I really love the book. Um, love the book. I actually think that the chemistry conversation was overblown. I don't think that they necessarily don't have good chemistry. I just think the movie itself just felt kind of hallmarky, a little cheap. But people seem to be resonating with it. It should have been a, a mini series. I agree. I also think they needed a bigger wig budget because they put some of these girls in some horrific, horrific wigs. In a set That's budget, I feel like the set of the my date with the president's daughter had a better Oval Office or oh. scan. Oh, spell classic. <laughs> like. um, but if Matthew Lopez is watching, I really loved it, and I would love a job um, on your, Wait, on your oh, next period. one. Period. Yeah, um, I loved, loved your movie. I've watched it every day <laughs> since it's come out. Actually, I literally watched to go to bed because it's so sweet, and I'm alone right now. Um, and it, and it, for, it was one of those movies that like made me want a boyfriend, and I feel like I never want one. So, good job, mm -hmm. Matthew Lopez, and good job, Taylor and the British one. <laughs> okay, well, going back to Roni. Yes, sorry. <laughs> if one of the Real Housewives of New York from the reboot were to have a cameo in Barbie Two, who would you pick and why? Brent. Well, I'm gonna say something. No, I I was gonna say Brent. I just have a second one. I do too. I feel like we have this. We have the same. Well, why? Why do you oh. say Bryn? I think Bryn's a Barbie. I think Bryn is is perfect and stunning and energetic and effervescent and and fun. Um, I I love Bryn. You could have asked me which person would you put on fucking Grey's Anatomy, and I think I'd probably still say Bryn. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I th I found. Wait, what's your second one? Because I want to know if we have the same one. I think, and this is like a. Maybe it's kind of like feel. I just think like Jenna would be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> like that, I could like see like maybe she's yeah. dressing them. Like it could be really fun. Boss yeah. Barbie, CEO Barbie. I would have um, loved to have seen Jenna as the CEO of Mattel. I think Cy would argue that Cy would be the one to choose. Would be mm -hmm. influencer and, Barbie and Uba and Uba. And I think Uba. actually, I think Uba is the Barbie of the group. Um, maybe just a cast cameo. Hey, I'm here for it. If anything, can, if anyone can make it happen, it's those Bravo Real Housewives commercials that they yes. do for all the movies. Yes. Okay, next here, back to the movie. Um, what is Gloria's daughter's name in the movie? Oh, God. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, I know that all of her and her friends are all the names of the Bratz dolls. Oh, that's fun. I yes. didn't know that. Yeah. Is it Isabel? No. Sasha? Wait, say that again? Sasha? It is yes. Sasha. Yeah, it's hey! Sasha. When Margot Robbie was on the press tour for this film, she did a bunch of interviews. How much money did Margot Robbie say Barbie would make when she was pitching the film to Warner Brothers? Yes. Mm-hmm. She did. She and when she said she was like, I made it up. She was like, it'll, she's like, it's never going to fucking make $1 billion. She's like, I just said it to say it. And then it did. I really do want to say Margot does not get enough credit for this movie and like how she put it all together. Like she was yeah. the one that wanted Greta. And yep. like, I feel like the conversation for Ryan Gosling, like getting an Oscar is so deserved. Like he did an amazing job, but I really, really hope that when the time comes around that Margot gets her flowers too. Cause I think that I she- was a huge part of making this movie happen. Okay, last question, and maybe it's a little deep to end on, but if you had the choice, would you live in Barbie land or the real world for the rest of your life? Ugh. Wow. Um, uh, <laughs> I would say the real world. I'm gonna be bold, even though like most days I think I'd love to live in the Barbie world, but I think um, the real world. And not because of the patriarchy. That's not why I'm saying that. I'm saying it because <laughs> I'm saying it because I think I think there is something to be said about, like we talked about earlier, the mountains we face, the the hurdles that make us who we are. I would have to agree. I feel like perfection gets exhausting over time, and just like you, the beach, the the beach is fake. Like things, things. I don't know. Like. The risks, I think, uh, circling back to earlier, like, the risks are always scary and they're worth it. I would rather have risks, risks than nothing. Or, like, than not. Um, like, I, it's always, like, those questions you are always asked, like, on, like, not trivia, but, like, tarot card readings or, like, people just speaking to me, like, would you rather know how your life ends or would you not? And I'm, like, I, my answer has always been no. Um, I feel like th that just takes away those experiences that really formulate you. 
Um, and I don't think they had a theater in Barbie Land. They did. They so, had a movie theater. They had a movie theater. No, they didn't have a regional theater. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a no-go. A, they didn't have an equity house. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so may, I, maybe I'll go to Barbie Land, actually, and I'll make it. In, I'll, I'll be in every fucking show. <laughs> I totally agree with you both. I think that the grass is always greener on the other side and the real world has so much opportunity. And I think if anything, for me, the movie shows that you have the power to chart your own path and to chart your own life and who you are. And you are the ones in control of defining that, not anybody else but yourself. And I'm thankful to you both for taking the time to be here today and sharing your insights. It's always so great um, chatting with you, Joe. And it's, it's great to have you after your first appearance, Jared. Also, wait, yeah, go watch all Jared's videos if anyone's listening. Jared is an incredible interviewer. I was stalking Jared before this and I saw you interviewed um, Halle Bailey. And I remember literally seeing that interview like on YouTube, like before the movie came out and it's like, oh my gosh, like this man's doing the thing. Um, you're truly killing That was a highlight of my life, take- literally. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely was like messaging Joe during that time. I just was like, I can't, yeah. Oh yeah. It's cool. It's definitely really, that's a big cool perk of my job mm-hmm. is the interviewing and it's fun. But yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was very special. You guys are both killing the game. So thank you both for taking the time to be here. Do you want to give everyone your socials so they can follow you on your journey? You can go ahead, Jared. Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at the Jared Alex. Uh, that's where all my interviews are. That's where I post stupid, stupid stuff. And then on Twitter at Hey, it's Jared or X. I don't know. Honestly, just follow me on Instagram. I actually just changed mine. So now it doesn't make sense to any of the other episodes. Um, my new username on Instagram is just my name. At Joe Hornberger. Um, and I'm still Hornburglar on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. Um, <laughs> come hang out and you can see all of Jared and I. It's like insane back and forth conversations about stupid, stupid, stupid shit. Um, <laughs> and on Instagram, you can see photos of my fucking face. So. <laughs> yeah, you, he's been some amazing he's been shots. Slowly revealing these headshots. Yes. Yeah. It's model era. I love it. Thank you guys both again for being here. You can follow me on Instagram at Mitchell Rail, R O E H L. And you can follow the podcast on Instagram at Unpack THT and on TikTok at Unpack That Pod. Again, thank you to Joe and Jared. And I'll see you guys right back here every other Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hi.